Some time ago, Judy and I were invited over to another couple's house for dinner. We didn't know them too well, but we shared a pleasant meal together, and our host had maybe a little bit more wine to drink than was good for him. He began talking rather freely about how he and his family were prepared should anything happen. Suddenly he jumped up from the table and he, and he said to me, let me show you. He opened a door off the kitchen leading to the basement. I really didn't know quite what to expect, but I was certainly intrigued. We went down the steps and I found myself in a hallway with a number of doors leading off to other rooms. My host took me down to the end of the hall to the last doorway. He pushed the door open and stepped aside, proclaiming, See, look at this! Inside the room was what appeared to be a tractor-trailer load of non-perishable food items. There were bags of rice and cans of vegetables organized according to expiry date, barrels and crates loaded with some kind of prepared meals, freeze-dried and ready to go. There was what looked like thousands of gallons of water in five-gallon containers. It was quite impressive. I turned to my host and said, this is a strange place to have a pantry, and this is a lot of food and water. He let out a chuckle and he said, this isn't our pantry, Wes. This is our prep room. It turns out, He's a prepper. To be honest, I had never heard the term prepper before, but if you've been paying attention to what's going on in the world and how so many people are becoming anxious and afraid over the future, you could probably guess what this is all about. The term prepper refers to a person or a group of people who are taking steps to prepare in case a disaster happens in the world, whether natural, political, or financial. Actually, there's a whole spectrum of preppers. Some preppers live in areas prone to natural disasters like hurricanes, so they prepare by having supplies in case water and food are unavailable in the wake of a disaster. Others believe political or financial turmoil might lead to the breakdown of civilization and they're preparing for a post-democratic society. In addition to food, water, and shelter, some of them are stockpiling weapons and ammunition in case of violence. Some of them have even taken to fortifying their homes against attack. What I found most interesting in all of this is the inherent worldview embodied by this movement, a belief that our country and our world are dangerously off track, that at some point the whole system is going to break down. And when that breakdown happens, it's best to be prepared. And let's be honest. Even if we're not involved in this movement, it's easy to see how someone could tip over the edge into these kind of paranoid beliefs. Or maybe not so paranoid. Just a few weeks ago, we had a front row seats to the storming of the U.S. Capitol. We've been trapped in our homes, unable to visit with family and friends or even worship together for the last year because of COVID-19. More and more countries, including North Korea and Israel, manufacture their own nuclear weapons. There's the rise of extremism and terrorism and the persistence of racial and economic inequality. Climate change threatens to make the planet unlivable for future generations. Who hasn't stepped back from this world we live in and thought, is this ship going down? How did we get to this place? Is there anything that can be done to stem the tide of destruction? Can we as individuals, communities, and the world be remade into something that is new and enduring? Is there reason 
for hope. In the same way, I imagine there are some listening to this sermon who have asked or are asking similar questions about their lives. How did I get so off track? Is there anything that can stem the tide? Is there any hope for me? And so this brings us to the ancient Israelite prophet, Jeremiah. Today, John read for us a passage from the 18th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called by God to preach prophetically to the Hebrew people of his day, who were precariously off track. They hadn't laid waste to their land or burned too many fossil fuels. They weren't experiencing a world war or meddling in nuclear bomb technology. Jeremiah accused them of having forgotten their special relationship to God, of no longer living as a people who had made a holy covenant with the Most High. In today's Old Testament passage, Jeremiah is summoned by God to go down to the potter's house. God has a message for Jeremiah. Jeremiah finds the potter working at his wheel. He's creating a vessel, but scripture tells us the vessel is spoiled in the potter's hands. And as Jeremiah looks on, he reworks it into a vessel that seems good to him. If you've ever sat at a potter's wheel, if you've ever dabbled in pottery, you know it's pretty easy for a potter's work to spoil. If a potter hasn't spent time centering the clay, it will be wobbly and misshapen. If she uses too much sponge or not enough, it will affect her ability to shape her work. If her hands don't work in a rhythmic pattern of pressure, the vessel will be ruined. And what does a true and experienced potter do when the vessel spoils? She begins again. She recenters the clay. She runs her hands across it with perfect pressure. She uses just the right amount of sponge. She reworks it into something that seems good to her. When a potter is at her wheel, there is always hope. There is always opportunity. Even if the vessel is off track, even if it spoils in her hands, there's always the ability to remake the clay into a more pleasing form as the creator may imagine. Christian faith teaches us hope is a gift God offers to every human being. Hope for today and hope for tomorrow. Now, Christian hope is not rooted in our circumstances. Christian hope is rooted in God's faithfulness. Hope is putting our trust in the belief there really is a potter. A potter who is shaping and reshaping our lives and the world into a vessel pleasing in God's sight. To hope in Christ is to embrace the opportunity to witness God's redemptive power, to believe God's purposes for our lives and for the world are good and benevolent. Jeremiah chapter 18 promises to us hope in God in the form of three invitations, which I encourage us all to accept and experience during this season of Lent. The first is to listen, to listen. In verse 2, God invites Jeremiah down to the potter's house to hear God's word. Jeremiah has to be in a place where he can hear God's voice. Is it possible when we're in constantly noisy places of worry, despair, or uncertainty, it becomes difficult perhaps even impossible, for us to hear the still, small voice of God? Is it possible we need to find places of calm and peace where we may be open to receive the voice of the divine, to hear God's challenging and hope-filled word for us this day? 
Maybe that's early in the morning when the house is quiet. Maybe it's on a walk through nature. Maybe it's while listening to classical sacred music. Whenever and wherever it is. Just as God invited Jeremiah, God is inviting us to enter a space where we can make our ears and our souls attentive to God's voice. The second invitation is to turn. To turn. In verse 8, God invites, actually calls his people to turn from their evil. God calls the people to turn from the way they've lived in the world. Jeremiah is telling the ancient Hebrew people of the ways in which they have strayed from God and the loving and generous covenant God had established with them. Is it possible, like the Israelites, God invites us personally and as citizens of the human race to turn from our former ways, ways leading to war and oppression, ignorance and bigotry, exploitation and inequality. The invitation is to turn, or as as Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This invitation is extended to each of us, just as it was extended to the people of Israel. We are called to turn back from the things putting us on a dangerous track where the whole of civilization is threatened with collapse. The third invitation is to trust. To trust. We are invited to trust in God's benevolent purposes for our lives, for our world, and for our universe. To trust in God's power to wisely and compassionately guide our lives and the life of our planet. This may be the hardest invitation of all to accept, because as human beings we have such a deep-seated need to be in control, to run our lives and our world in the way that seems, rightly or wrongly, to be best to us. Trust comes hard. Let me tell you a story. The great thinker and genius of modern physics, Albert Einstein, is on a train leaving Princeton, New Jersey, heading north. When the conductor comes to his seat, Einstein is unable to find his ticket. He searches through all his pockets, he looks in his briefcase, becoming extremely disturbed. The conductor tries to comfort him, saying, Dr. Einstein, don't worry about the ticket. I know who you are, and and you don't have to present your ticket for me. I, I trust that you purchased a ticket. About 20 minutes later, the conductor comes down the aisle of the train once again and sees Einstein still searching frantically for the misplaced ticket. The conductor again says to him, Dr. Einstein, please don't worry about the ticket. I know who you are. At that, Einstein stands up and says in a gruff voice, Young man, I know who I am, but I'm trying to find my ticket because I don't know where I'm going. I love that story because to one degree or another, we all want to know where we're going. We want to know what's next. We want to know that everything is going to be okay. And I think what happens is we decide. The only certainty will be found as we take control of things ourselves, as we use our own ingenuity, will, and planning to guarantee the future will be to our liking. We decide the only one I can trust is me. Me. If we want to put this into the context of today's scripture reading, we have decided we want to be both the potter and the the clay. We want to occupy both positions, being seated at the wheel and being placed upon the wheel. The truth is, we can only occupy one of those positions. We are either at the wheel or upon it. And to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, is to trust that one of those positions is already occupied by someone whom we can ultimately and finally trust. The creator is already seated at the wheel. God is the potter and we are the clay. 
and when we step back for a moment to consider the situation. This is a good thing. This is good news. God is working on us. God never stops working on us. God invites us to listen, to turn, and to trust. God knows what God is doing. We, we want contingency plans for when the whole thing comes crashing down, when everything collapses, our relationships, our work, our faith lies in ruins. What's the plan? What's the emergency scheme? What will we do then? We want a room in the basement of our lives, stocked up with water and non-perishable food items, with weapons and ammunitions in case of disaster. But God, God wants us to have faith. God wants us to trust we are in the caring and benevolent hands of a loving God. God is the good potter, centering us and shaping us and our world into that which is pleasing to God. So in this season of Lent, may we consider ourselves to have been invited by the word of God through the prophet Jeremiah. Invited to listen, to turn, and to trust. No matter how misshapen our lives or our world may appear, God, the God that became flesh in Jesus the Christ, is not finished with you or with me or with this good earth. Our future is in the hands of God, who, as the Apostle Paul assures us, is able, by the power at work within us, to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ever ask or imagine. Let us pray. And now unto God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all praise, honor, and glory, world without end. Amen.